Okay, we'll get started. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our next plenary speaker, Lucas Harris. Lucas is the Deputy Division Leader of the Weather and Climate Dynamics Division at NOAA GFDL. Lucas and I actually met for the first time, I think, um, back at one of the ASP summer schools about a decade ago or so. So it's a nice coming around, um, that, um, especially for the students attending the ASP colloquium, you will mm -hmm. know each other for a long time. So um, great. It's a pleasure, Lucas. Thanks again for accepting our invite and look oh, well, forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much, Anish. Thank you, Judith, also. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this, uh, yeah, to this wonderful colloquium. I mean, I, and I, I, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to attend some of the talks in my schedule. And yeah, the, the, the talks have been fantastic. And I hope to, hope to measure up to some of that uh, pretty high level, pretty high standard that's already been set. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to talk about our uh, S2S prediction efforts at uh, GFDL. In particular, two things I want to emphasize are the idea of uh, seamlessness going all the way from climate scale down to relatively short-term weather prediction and using models that are developed from both ends to help close the S2S predictability gap. Uh, the other thing I want to discuss is uh, the, the value of a seamless system for uh, going to sort of two ends of the, uh, of the prediction realm. One is the uh, coupled climate prediction end. Uh, you coupled to to uh, to a dynamic or a mixed layer ocean, uh, something that GFDL has been doing for over 50 years now, or going down to the convective scales of a few kilometers in which convection is uh, explicitly represented. So, uh, uh, so I want to start out with the third generation of uh, S2S modeling or modeling in general at GFDL. And uh, when I introduce uh, the third generation, I don't mean that I've uh, skipped the first or second generation. The first generation was the uh, were the, the legendary models developed by people like Suki Manabe and Kiko Miyakoda uh, that gave rise to coupled climate modeling, to medium range weather forecasting, and so on. Uh, the second generation was the uh, Steve Klein era of a uh, uh, of a of a CMIP type modeling uh, led by the CM two point one model and later a CM two point five uh, uh, CM three uh, high ramming floor. Uh, and the way that GFDL got into uh, S2S prediction was that we took these uh, excellent climate models been developed at GFDL, CM 2.1, CM 2.5, uh, which were the best and by a hair the second best in uh, CMIPS 3 and 5 respectively. Uh, and we wanted to start pushing them into the S2S range. Uh, and the way that we did that is we first started with emphasizing uh, the role of tropical convection and tropical cyclones in these models. Um, and uh, to do that, two things were done. One is to increase the resolutions of these models, both in the atmosphere and in the uh, coupled system. And the other was to introduce a new uh, convection scheme, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the UW-GFDL uh, double plume convection scheme that does an excellent job simulating tropical convection, tropical variability, and uh, hurricanes. Uh, so two models were developed to this purpose in that generation. And one is a uh, HIRAM, which is a, uh, it wound up being a 25 kilometer uh, non hydrostatic atmosphere climate model uh, in which you specify the SSTs. Uh, but the way we do that is we specify the uh, SST climatology, which evolves with time, plus frozen SST anomalies that are held static with time. And it turned out that actually had a lot of prediction potential. You could get a lot of the value of uh, seasonal prediction, especially for uh, especially in the tropics and in the summertime when we, ha we have a peak hurricane season. In, in the North Atlantic uh, without needing to couple to uh, a dynamic ocean. Uh, uh, we also explored some new capabilities within uh, using HIRAM. I mentioned the non-hydrostatic dynamics. And then beyond that, we were able to leverage the powerful variable resolution capabilities, our nesting and stretching capabilities to go to even higher resolutions within uh, HIRAM. Uh, the other approach that I wanna mention is a uh, floor double plume. This is a variant of the, uh, of the floor model, which is a uh, 50 kilometer atmosphere one, uh, uh, 100 kilometer ocean, uh, AM2 atmosphere plus MOM5 ocean. Uh, this did a fantastic job of predicting hurricanes, especially intense hurricanes would increase to 25 kilometer atmosphere resolution. And I'm gonna talk about some S2S results from these two models uh, to start out with. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention is that all the models I'm gonna discuss, all the GFDL models that use the same dynamical core, FE3, were unified around one uh, atmosphere dynamical core. And all the coupled models I'm gonna discuss use the modular ocean model, MOM either five or six, and the FMS coupler, which has a lot of, uh, a lot of neat features which are unfortunately beyond the uh, scope of my talk. And this, uh, this essentially is the first steps towards having a seamless prediction system all the way from short-term weather prediction all the way up to millennial timescale climate simulation. So here's a couple of examples. This is with the eight kilometer uh, high ram. This is the, uh, with a nested grid in the eight kilometer, uh, eight kilometer nested grid over the North Atlantic. 
And uh, we were able to get some pretty interesting results from our uh, climate simulations and S2S monthly predictions. Uh, you can see here on the left, this is a plot of observed radii of maximum winds from tropical cyclones, kind of a measure of uh, where the, uh, the size of the maximum winds in, uh, in a hurricane. And you can see that the distribution that we have in uh, eight, the eight kilometer nest matches the observations very well, perhaps maybe a little bit too small compared to uh, the observed hurricanes. But more interesting is that we are able to take a look at the climatology of rapid intensification, which is something that's been very hard for a lot of models to, to uh, simulate. And indeed, we were able to capture the right climatology of rapid intensification events where you have uh, maximum wind speed increasing by more than 15 meters per second over 24 hours. And this was not possible in a coarse resolution model at a 25 kilometer model. So this shows some of the uh, a really neat advantage of going to increasingly high resolution. Now you can talk about, well, what can you do with that higher resolution? And uh, so this is high ram, eight kilometer nest in high ram. This is a two way nest with the global domain. Um, and uh, we are able to find that putting in that two kilometer nest or excuse me, that eight kilometer nest here on the right was able to predict monthly uh, accumulated cyclone energy measure how strong your hurricanes are and major hurricane uh, accumulated energy with a correlation that matches that what we what was considered what is considered good for most models prediction of just seasonal hurricane count in the in a basin. So this kind of gives us a clue about what we can do with increasingly high resolution with variable resolution with some of the new uh, modeling uh, capabilities that are in the next generation of models. Now we can shift gears a bit. We can take a look at uh, a couple climate prediction system, floor DP here. Um, and one of the things we want to take a look at is uh, week five temperature predictions. Uh, so we can predict anomaly four and five. This is a S to S time scales. And take a look to see how this couple climate model does. And indeed, we were able to get uh, skillful predictions shown here in the dots of uh, temperature anomalies during the winter time in weeks three, uh, four, and in some places out to week five. And furthermore, we were able to find that a lot of the prediction skill from this came from uh, reconstruct came from the, our skill at predicting three modes in particular: uh, the a mode of variability associated with uh, ENSO. Uh, one with the North Atlantic Oceation and one's with, with this uh, Eurasian meridional dipole mode. Uh, so that's uh, that's where a lot of the skill for uh, these temperature anomalies is coming from. It's being able to predict these uh, large scale modes that we've heard heard a lot about during this colloquium. Uh, one thing you don't see here quite yet is the uh, MJO, which turned out to, at least in this model, didn't have a whole lot of impact on predicting these temperature anomalies, but does have use in other uh, domains, as I'll show uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so we can start thinking about how we can predict the uh, MJO and its uh, impacts as well. And the question remains, uh, one of the big questions is, what does it take to get a good MJO forecast? So in CMIP 5, a lot of models did very poorly with uh, MJO predictions. These are models that were developed in the late 20, in the late 2000s. Uh, and uh, indeed, the GFEL suite of models was one of those. CM 2.5 and CM 3 models didn't do very well for MJOs. But over time, uh, we uh, continue to develop our models. And in uh, AM4, which is uh, the, uh, which in this case, I'm showing a prototype of what became the uh, CMIP6, the current generation GFDL climate model. Uh, we found that if you just specify SSTs, you do not indeed get a good MJO. But when you couple to a MOM6 ocean, even here at 100 kilometers, you get, a, you get an actual propagating MJO. It's not as strong as that what you see in observations, but you do indeed get a useful MJO simulation that you can use for climate, for, uh, climate studies and in particular changes under climate change. So, and it's really ocean coupling that makes a difference. As, as long as you have an atmosphere model that has good enough, uh, especially things like uh, convective parameterizations to support that. Now from, again, you can go talk about, well, we can predict the MJO, so what? what what's the value of that? And one interesting thing about the MJO that we follow a lot in the summertime is that uh, the active phase of the MJO, there's a, there's a certain set of phases of the MJO under which uh, hurricanes and tropical cyclones are more common in the North Atlantic than uh, during this inactive phase of the MJO. Uh, and uh, observations see this pretty clearly when you average over a large number of seasons, uh, but no model had been able to pick this up to the best of my knowledge until we used a high ram, 25 kilometer high ram, and we ran a large number of years, and indeed we were able to reproduce this uh, MGO tropical cyclone link. And this could be a very important thing towards uh, getting good subseasonal predictions of the MGO and of uh, its impacts. 
So uh, th that's the that was that was then. And this is now. So we can proceed into our fourth or current generation of uh, S2S predictions. And I'm going to discuss two models for doing this. Two our two prediction models, the spear and shield prediction models that we've developed in the recent years at GFDO. So SPEAR is a uh, part of our uh, GFDL seamless modeling suite. SPEAR is itself, it's a seamless system for se seasonal to decadal prediction. Uh, this model is the uh, NOAA Research Earth System model uh, as uh, said in the re most recent implementation plan and is being used as the UFS's decadal to centennial application. So you'll extend the, the unified forecast system that uh, the National Weather Service is developing with OAR and its community partners into the climate realm. And uh, Spear comes in a couple of different flavors. Uh, one is the Spear Medium, which has a 50 kilometer AM4 atmosphere with the new convection scheme and some other cool new stuff in it. And coupled to a 100 kilometer MOM6 Ocean, the current generation of the modular ocean model. And this is a very efficient model, yet we'll, we'll show that it has very strong uh, prediction capabilities. Uh, this model was run in real time and submitted to the national, uh, to the uh, uh, North American Multimodal Ensemble uh, that's run at the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, there's also a 50 kilometer sphere large ensemble that's very useful for climate variability studies. You can go to our uh, website to learn about all this. We also see that it has very good variability and a very good mean climate state, which means it gives us an idea that it should be good at predicting the MJO. So we decided to take the system and we started to apply it towards uh, S2S predictions. And uh, we're, we've done a number of 45, we've, uh, our, so the person leading this, Bao Cheng Zhang, he's uh, done 45 day forecasts every five days over a 20 year time period. Uh, we're focusing on the winter time period or on the winter seasons here, uh, nudging the atmosphere and SST to Mera too. Uh, we're using only a 10 member ensemble here, which is relatively small, but we do already see very good results from that. And uh, here's an example of those good results. Uh, this is the uh, MJO prediction scale here. And uh, again, this is November through April forecast every five days over 20 years. And we, uh, we calculate scale the usual ways in the RMM index. And we take a look at the anomaly correlation coefficient here. And what we find is that the uh, skill is actually quite good, if you, especially when you take a look at the full ensemble. The full ensemble gets you 18 days of good predictability, ACC above 0.7, and 30 days of useful predictability, uh, ACC of 0.5. Right. And indeed, we find that actually this is improved for fast propagating events, that there's some opportunistic forecast you can make in which the MGO predictions from this ensemble get even better. And one of the first things I want to point out is that uh, the ensemble does get you extra predictability over the, uh, over the individual ensemble members. If you just one, ran one, on one member, a deterministic forecast, you'd only get 23 days of forecast skill. Uh, the second thing is I want to say is that 30 days, again, is better than all the models that have been previously investigated, except for the European Center. However, the European Center is only a couple of days better than this. So, uh, so I, don't, I don't mean to disparage the European Center or any of the other models, which are all fantastic, frankly. And the uh, ability for climate models to improve their, their uh, MJO prediction skill without needing to do weird things like super parameterization or three kilometer resolution everywhere. I think it's one of the great success stories of climate science over the last decade. And one of the real, uh, one of the real things that the climate modeling community can be very proud about, both here in the, in the United States and worldwide. Uh, one thing we do see is that the amplitude of this, uh, uh, the amplitude of the MJO does decrease faster than observed. Uh, we have some reason to believe from our uh, later, this later simulations I show you, this, this is perhaps maybe a resolution issue or still at 50 kilometer resolution. Uh, the other thing you can see is that the spread here, the spread is still not as high as the root mean square error, which still, which indicates that we're still maybe under dispersive in this ensemble. Uh, again, uh, the MJO itself is a wonderful thing to predict. What can you do with it is what really what counts. Uh, you can compare uh, the teleconnections for all the different flavors of the MJO here. Uh, a couple of different flavor, uh, flavors or types of MJOs have been identified. And they all have different predictabilities. Uh, so in particular, uh, we find that some of these modes are more predictable than others. I mentioned that the fast uh, MJO, it's already, the MJO itself is more predictable and the teleconnections, which are particularly important. Uh, I live right here in New Jersey. Uh, and this is indeed where uh, a good, uh, where a lot, of a lot of people in the United States do live. Uh, that that it, this is one of the most valuable ones to predict. And indeed, we are able to do a good job predicting this and its teleconnections. Uh, we do, the same is true for the uh, jumping MJO here, which has uh, more pr has prediction skill both on the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. 
as well as these ecologically sensitive areas in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, the uh, standing and slow MJOs are a bit more difficult to predict their teleconnections. A big reason for that is just the fact that those MJOs, particularly the standing MJO, it has been shown to be more difficult to predict in sphere. But this is a very good sign, it's very good progress that we can actually capture not just the not just the MJO itself, but what its significance is for those of us living here in North America and, and, and us elsewhere as well. The other uh, modeling system I want to discuss is uh, SHIELD, which stands for the System for High Resolution Prediction on Earth to Local Domains. This is more of a weather model that we've developed that grew out of the uh, NGGPS uh, project that we're working on with the Weather Service and again, the broader community. Uh, you can go to the portal here for more information about SHIELD's configurations, including uh, real-time forecasts and links to uh, our papers that we've written on SHIELD. Uh, SHIELD is designed as a unified system for weather to subseasonal prediction uh, that heavily utilizes the non-hydrostatic dynamics and the variable resolution capabilities within FE3. And the way that I like to say is that this is a UFS implementation that is one code, one executable, one workflow. You can do all these different applications from the same code base. Uh, we've also developed a uh, container and submitted a paper to uh, geo geoscientific model development that describes this container. The configuration I'm gonna talk about right now is called S-Shield, which uses a 25 kilometer atmosphere with uh, weather model physics. Uh, I wanna particularly point out the uh, mixed layer ocean uh, which is a much simpler ocean than the fully dynamic ocean. So it's, it's very cheap. It's a few lines of code, essentially. Uh, we use the SSTs, nudge climatology, plus those frozen anomalies again. Um, and we'll actually find that uh, just having a mixed layer ocean itself can be very, a very powerful thing. Uh, and so two results from, in particular I want to point out from S-Shield. Uh, I want to point out the uh, diurnal cycle of uh, surface precipitation in S-Shield. And uh, in particular, we're focusing on the uh, warm season diurnal cycle here. We compare that against our 13 kilometer shield, which is our flagship shield configuration we use for medium range forecast. Uh, that model is kind of like the GFS in that sense. And what we find is that this 25 kilometer S shield gets the, per gets the phase of precipitation both over tropical land and Northern hemisphere land and specifically over the United States, it gets that phase just about right. And this is actually a superior diurnal cycle to all the other CMIP-5 models. And you can see that its amplitude is it's a little bit low, especially over here in the United States, where uh, a lot of that warm season, uh, a lot of that warm season effect comes from, uh, comes from convective, mesoscale convective systems that are hard to resolve. Uh, that is rectified by going to 13 kilometer resolution, uh, in which we fully pick up the right phase and amplitude of the uh, Manajulian oscillation. And uh, one other thing, uh, I don't mean to belabor the point, but uh, there's two things about this. One is that we believe that the, uh, uh, the weather model physics, weather models are evaluated on partially on their six hour prediction, precipitation prediction scale. If you mess up your diurnal cycle, you're gonna mess up your forecast. And that also the good diurnal cycle we found can improve our uh, MJO prediction. And our uh, intern has actually done some interesting uh, work on that. Stella Heflin, uh, NOAA intern has done some interesting work on that this summer. Uh, one of the big things we find is that by simply having a mixed layer ocean, instead of specified SSTs, we extend our MJO prediction skill by eight days. And uh, this is a pretty major result in this case. This is a very simple change, but it re re results in much better prediction of the Mad and Julian oscillation. Uh, okay, and now I wanna discuss a bit about a uh, convective scale S2S, an exciting new possibility uh, here at GFDL that we're using with our, uh, with our shield configurations. Uh, one is to use uh, one is to put a nested grid over the Madden, over uh, the area of the Madden Julian oscillation over the maritime continent. This is actually suggested by uh, Tim Palmer to me at a uh, European Center uh, workshop a couple of years ago. He said that if I wanted to improve precipitate, uh, if I wanted to pr improve S 2 S prediction over the United States, instead of putting a nest over the United States, you can put it over the maritime continent, improve the MJO, and you're going to presumably improve its teleconnections as well. And so when we did that, we took a 16 kilometer global domain, put in a four kilometer nest. And we found that we actually, during the dynamo period, for cases that began in phases three and four, which is where, uh, just before it enters the maritime continent, where these models had the biggest trouble simulating the MJO, we find that in this very difficult case, putting in that nested grid extends useful predictability out to 39 days, uh, which is a pretty neat result in this case. And uh, this is all done by a relatively efficient configuration here. You can get 40 days in eight hours on 4,000 cores using a relatively old supercomputer now. 
We did find that there are some uh, challenges with phases six and seven. Uh, once they get into the Western Pacific, both uh, the global domain and the nested domain had some trouble propagating the MJO correctly through there. Uh, we have actually a solution for this problem. Uh, so we're gonna be continuing to develop this model. Another cool, another cool thing we can do is put a nested grid over the, over the continental United States and look at precipitation systems, particularly severe weather. This is a uh, five kilometer nest put over the continental United States. Uh, this is a uh, what we call a sea shield for continental United States. Again, this is a very efficient model. And uh, we find that uh, the diurnal cycle of phase and amplitude in the, for these warm season forecasts, these springtime forecasts, is just right. The, the amplitude and phase are correct of precipitation in these models every day. Uh, we find there's a dry bias that is developing later weeks. Once again, we do have a solution for this. We've uh, improved our model in, re in, in this past year to improve some of our surface biases. We've seen some pretty nice improvements from that in our short range, our five-day severe storms forecast at three-kilometer resolution. Um, and we have found that uh, by predicting severe storms by looking at uh, their uh, proxies in terms of rotating updrafts. So at five kilometers, you can resolve a rotating updraft in uh, Sea Shield and also uh, uh, in other FD3-based models we found. By looking at the anomalies in the updraft helicity, that severe storm signature, we find that there are there is skill at predicting severe weather outbreaks uh, on, on uh, sub-seasonal timescales out to week four, especially in parts of the nation, especially say up here in the uh, Northern Plains, where severe weather isn't as common this time of year, and it's not uh, in predicting, uh, predicting anomalies in severe weather activity is most valuable. And predicting severe weather in the, the southeastern United States and the southern plains. Basically, if you give a forecast that there's going to be severe weather, it's going to be bad. So it's a little harder to improve on that. And finally, I want to briefly discuss our uh, global cloud resolving model called the X Shield. Uh, NASA and JFDL, we pull three base GCM since uh, we've uh, contributed to both phases of diamond. We finally get uh, we find that we get excellent tropical cyclones and uh, penetrative convection in these models. Uh, X Shield is a very fast global cloud resolving model. Uh, this is the fastest non-hydrostatic global cloud resolving model in diamond phase one, 20 days per day with 14,000 cores. Um, and uh, one question I keep coming into is what exactly is a good purpose for these uh, uh, global cloud resolving models beyond them being in a nice tech demo and a preview of what, you, what medium range forecasting is gonna look like in the future. And we can use it to study uh, uh, how convection or how resolved convection interacts with large scales. And this is kind of a unique problem because uh, in traditional global models, we parameterize convection. There's all these tuning parameters, so you can always tune them to get a good result. That's something a little bit harder to do when you're explicitly simulating convection and you get this updraft that is forming itself. Um, so here's an example of a updraft within uh, within X shield. Here, this is a two delta X updraft uh, cross section through it, and uh, you see example here of transporting a tropical planetary boundary, boundary layer air into the free troposphere in the tropics, which is then uh, entrained into the uh, higher latitudes through the uh, Hadley cell. So I'm running out of time. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip this. And, and also, unfortunately, our, uh, our, our community grid tools effort, uh, GT4Pi, to pour FV3 and the, and the UFS GFS physics into, uh, into, this, grid, into this new uh, new sort of atomic language to be able to compile it directly towards a, set, a, a large number of uh, computing platforms such as GPUs, and then whatever comes next after GPUs or even the new versions of GPUs that seem to be introduced every week. And finally, a few thoughts about uh, S2S prediction. Uh, uh, we've talked a lot about how there's a bit of a gap between weather, simulate, weather, between weather forecasting and climate modeling that S2S fits into. Uh, unifying models, something that's being done a lot here within uh, NASA and NOAA, within NOAA here, and also by our partners at NASA, that can fill in the S2S gap, but it's a hard scientific problem. And it's not just an engineering problem in which you just stick your models together like Legos. Um, and to really take advantage of this unification, uh, I think a broader view of the Earth system is really necessary, given how everything tends to get knitted together on these longer time scales. Uh, you're not just blending together all these different systems, uh, all, all these different subcomponents. You're also talking about how the variability interacts with one another and how short-term simulation skill, how prediction of short, what things we typically predict on very short ranges, what happens to them on longer time scales. And I think that the kind of reductionist approach is studying each individual phenomenon in isolation or a particular component or even developing a particular component in isolation and stitching together isn't really going to work. Um, 
and that kind of brings me to my next point is that, yeah, you really need a you really need to take this very holistic idea and you really need people who are going to think about how to blend everything together. Pieces in a modeling system must work together. Um, and to wrap up, I know I'm running short on time. This is a, it's an excellent aspirational goal to try to unify all of our modeling systems and across all these different uh, systems here. We may never get to a truly unified seamless system, maybe not. Uh, 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 I think, I think it is possible, but it's, yeah, it's not assured at this point, but I really think we do need to try at least that sort of grand unification. And at the very least trying to do that will get us better models. And that's the real value of this whole activity. Can we make better for, weather forecasts? Can we make better climate simulations? And uh, with that, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks a lot, Lucas. That was yeah, really comprehensive talk. And yeah, thanks again to you yeah. for introducing us to so many different um, systems. Yeah, thank Any you so questions? much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any questions for Lucas? I don't see one on chat yet, Lucas. So I had one question. Maybe it's more of a philosophical question based on this um, slide sure. you put up and also the results you showed with the cloud resolving or convective scale permitting um, results you showed from the maritime continent example of improving the MGO prediction skill, right? Mm -hmm. So as we go into like the seamless prediction and like the unified earth system modeling framework, do you think our development would be more targeted towards like user defined needs? Like for instance, if we want to improve the MJO and MGO's teleconnection, we need to either improve the resolution in the tropics and um, get that right. But then that goes at the cost of resolving other things like sub scale in the ocean or other processes in the earth system, right? So where should the cost versus benefit um, of resolving or representing processes in the full earth system be? Should it be defined by user needs or should it be defined by specific processes in the earth system? Um, that's a fantastic question, and I don't think there is a single good answer to that. Um, but I think that maybe the best solution to that is uh, the, having a diversity of models and a diversity of modeling centers that are working on new ideas and modeling. And the example that I like to give, uh, so I, I mentioned this in a talk with a lot of uh, European guests a few weeks ago, and yeah, I got, a, <laughs> got an interesting reaction. You take a look at the, weather, at, the, at the climate modeling community here in the United States, and there's people who bemoan that there's too many climate models. There's people saying there's eight global there's eight global models, climate models, whatever. I think that's actually a wonderful thing. And if you take a look, U.S. climate modeling is the best in the world. Uh, like every like every CMIP session, it's it's NCAR, it's GFDL, and you know, all on top. You see uh, the models being developed by uh, NASA, by the Navy, by DOE. That they're all producing all this wonderful science, these wonderful predictions, and these wonderful analysis and wonderful tools that are of societal impact. Um, and I, I really think that it will have to be to some extent, it's gonna have to be user-defined problems, but at the same time, we need to develop those individual processes as well. And having this diversity of models here in the United States, uh, that is really our great strength. It's really diversity that drives the field forward. Um, in fact, you can compare that against uh, what's, what's happened here to uh, regional, regional weather models in the United States where everybody's forced into one solution. And uh, yeah, that feels kind of stagnated over the last two decades. Great, thanks, Lucas. Chidong, do you have a question? And then Judith after that. Chidong, would you like to unmute and ask? If not, uh, yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Lucas, for the presentation. I just wonder, um, um, right now, uh, there is a lot of a push to the global uh, cloud resolving model. And uh, uh, I, I know there's at some, at some time uh, there are also attempts to have the adaptive uh, cloud, cloud uh, resolving great global model. Uh, can you comment on the pros and the cons of the two approaches? So by, by adaptive, do you mean like a grid that dynamically uh, refines and de-refines itself uh, during a simulation or uh, do you mean- That's right, yeah, in time, in time and space, yes. 
Okay, so uh, that's actually, that is again, another interesting question. Um, one thing about adaptive mesh refinement, which has been very popular in uh, the computational fluid dynamics community, it's been difficult to get a lot of these approaches to work in the atmosphere because, and my understanding is that the big problem is what exactly are, what, what's your refinement criteria? And worldwide, there won't be just one refinement criteria. I mean, a refinement criteria that works for tropical cyclones, say, probably won't work for uh, heavy rainfall in the latitudes. Um, I mean, there are some approaches that do work quite well, um, especially uh, the moving nests that are that were in, in fact invented here at GFDL that's used in uh, HWARF and in uh, some of the hurricane models. Um, uh, and, and Overall, these uh, the variable resolution approaches, I think they're very nice ways to get started towards going down to very high resolution at relatively uh, low computational cost. Um, but they do add complexity to your modeling system. And on top of that, uh, a lot of, we do run into some problems where we have this issue about how do you communicate from your high resolution, ver high resolution region out to your global domain. And that's not necessarily guaranteed, especially if you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, parameterizations that are fixed around certain parts, certain resolutions. And scale awareness does help a bit, but it's not a panacea for all these problems. Um, so, but however, I have to just say that I really do like the idea of variable resolution. And indeed the people who are working on adaptive, uh, adaptive grid refinement, I really like the fact that people are still working on that because it could be a very powerful tool uh, in the coming years. So uh, thank you, Chidong. Thank you for that excellent question. Thanks. Chirong, thanks, Lucas. Judith? Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I would be, so you showed that the, the MDO um, spread was under discursive, and I was wondering if you comment a little bit on the model error schemes you are uh, planning to use in these uh, different model configurations. Okay, thank you for that question. So in, uh, so in Spear S2S, we're using the SPPT scheme that was implemented in the GFS. And uh, we did find that that did help improve the skill uh, of uh, the MJO by a decent amount. Um, so it, took, it did take some work to get that, uh, to give it the best results, but we did see that it did help improve the ensemble spread a bit and, and the prediction skill. Uh, the other thing we actually found is that it helped improve uh, hurricane intensity as well, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't recall the details exactly of that, but we did find that it was, it did, did help improve our simulation of tropical cyclones, which is, Again, kind of a counterintuitive thing. Um, we do want to look into other approaches. Uh, the PSL uh, cellular automaton of, of uh, perturbing the uh, parameters within, a, within the convection scheme, particularly uh, some of these things that we don't have a good understanding of. So perturbing the tendencies, uh, it's a little bit of an ad hoc thing because we, uh, it kind of it breaks energy conservation to some extent. Uh, you actually do have a good understanding of how the atmosphere is heated, even if the processes leading to that heating are poorly understood. Whereas at the same time, things like uh, the entrainment rates in a deep convected plume or the, uh, the mass flux, those things are poorly understood. Those are really the things that you do want to perturb. And the cellular automaton approach being uh, pioneered there at uh, PSL, I think that's a fantastic idea. And we want to be able to introduce that within uh, Shield and Spear. Okay, so th thank you so much, Judith. That's a fantastic question. Thanks, Thanks Judith. Thanks, Lucas. So yeah, we do have, um, some more time. Rich Neil and um, due to technical difficulties is unable to join us. So we can take one more last question for you, Lucas, if that's okay. And then we we'll move to the student presentation. Sure. Andy, yeah. would you like to unmute and ask? Sure. Yeah. Really interesting, exciting work. Thanks. Great presentation too. Um, and I like hearing you discuss this seamless system concept. You know, it's been sort of bandied about for a long time, but it seems like having some more pragmatic comments on how it might actually work and what's really possible in that regard is, is I think, really nice to see. But actually, that wasn't my question. I just wanted to comment on that. But um, I'm wondering, you had you mentioned that you thought the ensembles were kind of small, you know, resolves signal noise, and you could certainly see the benefit in the ensemble mean over individual members. How far could you push with larger ensembles? Like what would be feasible and what do you think the potential benefits would be of, of increasing the ensemble sizes? 
that's a, that's a good question. Um, so there's two points to that. One about uh, the, the yeah the seamless system. I have to I have to uh, admit that I use seamless in three different senses in my talk. Uh, seamlessness in part from all the way from weather and climate. Seamlessness in a single modeling system. Seamlessness between uh, different slightly different modeling systems that are in the same framework and so on. So I have to apologize for doing what is kind of a dodge in that sense. And seamless is kind of an undefined concept in my, my opinion. Uh, but you, you raise an excellent point about, uh, about uh, using larger ensembles. And we found that we can get a good result with 10 ensemble members. Uh, there's nothing stopping us from using more ensembles. So like for the Spear Large Ensemble, there's a 30, me there's a 30 member ensemble there. It's been released to the public. Um, and those are multi-decadal simulations in that case. Um, the uh, uh, the exact ensemble size, I know that there's a lot of work that could be done to say what the ideal size for a simulation is, whether it be the data simulation or whether it's for uh, actually producing the prediction ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think that maybe having a bigger ensemble could be a useful thing when you have extra computing time. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I mean, if you had like a, a million ensembles of a 50 kilometer model, you could still not simulate severe thunderstorms. Yeah. Um, so there will always be value of going to increasingly high resolution to resolve a new phenomenon or trying new approaches in your model. Uh, the variable resolutions is one, uh, trying different physics out, which is what we've been doing here at GFDL with the weather and climate model physics. Uh, that's another possibility. Um, like I said, uh, I think a diversity of approaches is important. I mean, like what goes on at UKMO and at uh, European Center, they've done fantastic jobs developing ensembles. Uh, there's been really great work going on here in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. So there, I really think that, I don't think there's a, once again, there's a well-defined answer to that. I think both approaches do need to be followed. And I th do think we have a big enough community to do that. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank yeah, you, it's Andy. good to hear the opinion. Great. great, thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks again, Lucas. Great talk and yeah, great discussion as well. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks thank for inviting you. me. Thanks.